Well, you've had a bit of a foretaste of some of the forces that are at play in Surrey. And uh, I'm, I'm here tonight to speak more at the building or development scale, and particularly in terms of the impact of the role of market development as in the act of city making. And uh, as we all see through the representation here of the speakers tonight, that it doesn't happen through any one of those entities that participate in a true partnership in creating the vision, and certainly in Surrey, the vision for the city that uh, it has identified as a different city and the city of the future. It's young, it's dynamic, it's diverse. And uh, unfortunately, we live in a world where our policy world and our planning world and our architecture and urban design world sometimes work a little bit too much in silos. And for the 10 years that we've been working in city center, we started off coming in the door with a 20-year-old city center plan uh, that really was generated around the time of the construction of the Expo Line. And what it simply parachuted in was a vision for another of the string of urban town centers that have popped up along that transit route. But for 20 years, none of that development came to Surrey. And so what fundamentally shifted about eight, 10 years ago was a realization that if there was a politically supported and a planning uh, generated policy that governed a vision for what the new city center of Surrey could be, that it really would only be accomplished through the partnerships of both public and private entities working across traditional boundaries to make the exceptional moves happen very early in the game. Uh, an interesting pattern developed in the 10 years that we've been doing development. At one point, we had 30 acres of the city centre under application and 17 different projects with over 4,500 residential units in the pipeline. It simply exceeded the market demand and the reality of the need by about 15 years and a factor of about 20. The absorption rates in Surrey for market residential hover around the 200 to 250 units per year mark, and yet we currently have market development in the pipeline that could supply you in short order if the demand was there, again, probably thousands of units. So there is a little bit of a disconnect between the true market forces that the city actually traditionally has depended on to successfully deliver the infill development that it plans for and the reality of the market forces at play to make that happen. And what I'm particularly interested tonight is the moves that private sector and public sector have made to bring those two ends together. And I think the Three Civic Plaza project that I'll highlight tonight is probably one of the foremost examples of that form of partnership. But if you look at the downtown core, not much of what currently exists there as the first major moves would happen without a truly exceptional forms of partnership that are quite unique in terms of how our region and our various sectors of the industry uh, deliver the kind of development that accomplishes our urban visions. So the city making process requires vision, policy and partnership. The second major point that the city that is being created in Surrey is far different than what is the knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, it's the next metropolitan urban center, so it'll be, of course, modeled on the city of Vancouver. And that simply isn't the case. And I was hoping to get a slide of Vancouver's skyline in 1920. Because if you really want to understand where Surrey is in achieving its very aggressive and bold urban vision for an urban, dense urban core, uh, imagine the Hotel Vancouver, the Marine Building, the Sun Tower. And that was the entire high-rise landscape of the city of Vancouver at the turn of the century. Who built those buildings? It wasn't private development. They were speculative done in a boosterist economy that was promoting Vancouver as a rail destination, both for industry, connecting it to marine activity, and also promoting tourism. Those are the kinds of single acts that get the party going. And if you look at the skyline of Surrey right now, you'll see at the focal point that 52-story tower that is 15 years ahead of its time, that is entirely out of place, because it isn't supported by the kind of 
in the kind of supporting density around it that would make economic sense for that to happen as a private market development. And yet it's there, we're uh, under construction right now and part of our team here tonight. We're about halfway up through the building and we're scheduled to be completion within 14 months. If you look at the patterns of development that we've been involved in over the last 10 years, an interesting pattern evolved that where the city focused on creating a vision for the dense urban core and the finer grid of streets and bringing all of the social and institutional and educational amenities to the core, um, they realized very quickly that the first wave of development didn't go into the center, it created a donut. And it's not totally indicated here, but what happened was developers came to town and they bought the vision. They realized that the lowest land prices were the single family neighborhoods one block removed from the city center. And there was no economic incentive to buy a perfectly profitable, revenue producing strip mall on King George Highway at twice the land value to build the city's vision of a dense urban core. So here is the first fundamental mismatch that the first wave of market development did not come where the city wanted it. But Don and his team were flexible enough to realize that the city was not going to shape itself the way that we would traditionally pattern it on traditional urban patterns of growth. Because the city just simply does not have a compelling reason to have a core at this location apart from transit-oriented development. We have no waterfront development to sell Coal Harbor real estate. We have entirely different forces that generate reasons why people choose to live here that have nothing to do with the patterns of development that we've seen in the city of Vancouver. So what is happening here is that ring of donut development. So these uh, lower priced lands on the periphery of the core was where we started to see the ability of developers to come in and consolidate nine acres, 10 acres, take up one of those super blocks. And at one point we brought in, in the span of 18 months, five applications for entire nine, 10, 12 acre parcels within the city. The outdated city center plan gave us zero guidance, and fortunately there was enough senior level staff involvement in the planning department to realize the potential impacts of getting these first developments right and capturing the road allowances to get that finer grid of streets. But this actually predated the current city center plan update that is now in place. And there was a bit of catch up. So we were very fortunate to do some city planning, some urban design, and to work shoulder to shoulder with senior planning to bring forward the right forms of development that the market could afford to build. And there were some high rise developments uh, they were some mid-rise and low-rise developments. And along the way, the BC Code changed to bring in mid-rise. And I think, Don, if you compare kind of your first crack at modeling the growth of city centre to 2040, the first vision was from south to north, it was a sea of towers that looked very much like the urban density of Vancouver. When we started to see the actual patterns of growth and the market forces at play, and we realized that the missing link here was that the kinds of places people move to Surrey to live in have to be more affordable, they want to be more walkable, they need to be in better quality neighborhoods, and there is no compelling reason why anybody would come to live that high-rise urban experience without the context that exists where that thrives. So there is an opportunity and we went back and we created peaks and valleys and we actually downgraded density throughout the city centre to introduce a series of individual neighbourhoods that would bring back more of that pedestrian scaled character, increase density by nearly the same amount but in a form that will be much different at the end of the day from the kinds of cities that we've seen certainly in Vancouver. The land pressures don't exist to create that form of urban uh, upward development. And so we're hopeful that what we're creating in Surrey is quite a unique city for the future. Imagine a city where we've been able to preserve the greenways, we've been able to introduce a green network of spaces and public open spaces that provide habitat for uh, environmental benefit and that one block from the city center you have an, an actual fish bearing stream. Uh, so this is a different form of urbanism. And while we see many of these applications coming forward that are trying to realize that urban vision, they are challenged because the market forces are still not there to support them entirely, but certainly not to support the number of uh, projects that are currently in the pipeline. So it is going to be a slow process. 
certainly the market development process will be slower than anybody anticipated or would like. And so what happens is that if this is the vision of the first big moves by the market sector, and it's a long, slow process to get there, and I argue it's probably more like 20 or 30 years, then we go back to the statements from the other speakers tonight about what we can do in the rest of the city where people are actually choosing to move and live in for the range of reasons that you heard. So what we're left with in city centre is more mid-rise walkable neighbourhoods like this uh, Quattro district, um, achieving high levels of density but in a different, more affordable form in wood frame. And the towers will probably be far and few between or will be very slow in coming. Three Civic Plaza is kind of a unique example, however. Um, the city recognized that it would not and could not rely entirely on private development to accomplish its vision. And wisely, the political vision and support all the way through senior staff and planning was there to make an investment to get the city center identified and to get it defined and get it on track. Fortunately, the city also owned a good section of the land where the city center core is being planned. And so when funding came available, the public library was, uh, was built. The move to make the city, transfer of city hall to the city center was probably the largest catalyst uh, to date and building on the other provincial initiative, uh, government initiative in building the original vision for Central Surrey, which is an ICBC headquarters and some other. It was only after that was built by government incentive that it found its second iteration as what it really should have been, a community asset bringing institutional, educational, retail and office and employment to a, a city center. That's the kind of mix of uses that are required but they don't happen as market developments. And so what you have in front of you here is just that northern precinct of the city centre, the library on the lower left, the new city hall, which is now open. And when we sat down with planning and with the city officials, we realised that what we had created was a heart to the new city, an urban plaza, but unfortunately it was landlocked at the middle of the block. It had no street access. And in Surrey, where you have a fairly dispersed pattern of buildings and a lot of open space, um, it is a bit of a toothless grin when it comes to urban design. And there is always concern over personal safety and use of unsupervised or, or not a properly um, overlooked or supervised public outdoor space, that there was concern that after City Hall workers went home and the library was closed, that that plaza would be kind of a dark place that you wouldn't want to cross in the middle of the night to get to transit. And so the inception of this project came from a fundamental belief that in the act of city making, there needed to be a partnership with a private developer that would complement the institutional and public amenity investments with a private development that would bring the largest possible mix of uses and certainly more than the market would dictate was feasible. So only through a private developer and public initiative of the city of Surrey and a located on city property next to the city hall, we brought in 350 residential units, 50,000 square feet of office space that contain three floors of an urban campus for Kwantlen University. So we have an educational and institutional component. There are restaurants, conference facilities and retail and a 144 room hotel. And if you look at the market dynamics of being building hospitality in a suburban market, are comparable as a four-story Best Western and a 25-year-old uh, underperforming, I hope they don't, the owners aren't here tonight, um, a tower uh, hotel at Guilford that was built back in the 70s. But the market doesn't sustain this kind of vision for a very urban um, hotel. Because of the partnership, we were able to make it work and because of the commitment and belief of the private developer in the vision that the city had created, that investment happened. So now you look at this at the north end of the precinct and you look at central city at the south end of the precinct and you can start to see the formation of the two anchors that will form that really comprehensive civic core. And our hope in the future is that as we move forward and we see the remainder of infill development, that the future really will rely upon the creation of a series of spaces that are bringing institutional, educational, public amenity, social services that link back what this community needs 
what Surrey needs, what its young and diverse population needs at the heart of its city. And so fundamentally, that's my premise tonight, that we're going to get a different city than anybody could ever imagine. It will come via forces that are not the traditional delivery methods in our industry. And it is only through cooperation and vision that any of this could happen. And thank you for including me in the conversation.